Peter Godesby, Professor of Neurology at King's College Hospital in London and the University of California, San Francisco. All right. Um, what's being assumed at the present about visual snow? Visual snow, as it's referred to by patients and, and many doctors, I think has been called a number of things and mixed up with some things that it ought not be mixed up with. The first main confusion is the relationship of visual snow to migraine aura. Some people conflate the two. Uh, some people think that migraine aura and visual snow are more or less the same, um, that the causes are the same, and they sometimes refer to visual snow as a migraine aura or refer to people who've got a persistent aura as having visual snow. I think they're very distinct conditions. Mm -hmm. I think the phenotype, the behaviour of migraine aura is very typical and the behaviour of visual snow is very typical and they're very typically different. Yeah. I also think that visual snow is being confused or um, um, tarred, if you want, with a, a brush uh, concerning the use of hallucinogenics, LSD and marijuana mm -hmm. and so forth. We've been interested in this for a while. We've spoken to more than 250 people with visual snow. Very few have any, very few have any history of hallucinogenic uh, drug intake. I, I just think it's completely wrong to think of visual snow as either a form of migraine aura, mm -hmm. it's different, or simply a consequence of, uh, of previous drug intake. Yeah. It's a very distinct syndrome on its own. I haven't seen every person with visual snow in the yeah. world. Yeah. So I can't, I, I can't say that, that, that no mm -hmm. one has, has it because of um, illicit drug use. I haven't seen a convincing case mm -hmm. yet. Yeah. And, I think, and I've seen a lot of cases that have the problem without having used yeah. illicit drugs, yeah, particularly children, mm -hmm. uh, where it's clearly crazy to suggest yeah. that a seven or an eight-year-old yeah. would have been using LSD. But, yeah. So... It, it's clear that you can have this syndrome without using illicit yeah. drugs. So I think focusing on illicit drugs as a cause is it's unhelpful. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I only think that what, what the people I spoke to, and also the two doctors I spoke to, Dr. Abraham and uh, uh, an other doctor I just met, that illicit drugs can trigger it. But I think you've got to talk to a lot of patients with the problem first. Yeah, yeah. And I think another big problem with visual snow has been the actual definition of it. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing we've worked the most on in the last year and a half or so. When we started talking, we first talked about well, what's it confused with. The reason visual snow is confused with other things is actually um, no one's been working on, on visual snow itself and to provide, so to provide a definition yeah. of the problem. If you don't have a clear definition of what you're talking about, we're all talking about different yeah. things. Now, the people, you may have been talking to physicians who've talked to other patients and are calling something visual snow, which I wouldn't call visual snow. Mm -hmm. What I hope to establish, one of the first things I hope to establish, is a clear um, definition for what, broadly speaking, visual snow is, yeah. so we can all be talking about the same thing and researching the same thing will make better progress that way. If you toss everything together, yeah. we're never going to make any progress. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Schenken said that to have visual snow syndrome, you have to have visual snow, the static, and three additional symptoms, I recall, in this, in this uh, publishing. Well, what we've done, uh, what um, Christoph Schenk and I have done, is look at, we did a, we, we a three-tiered study, if you want. Yeah. We have patients that I've seen over the years with, with the problem who form the, the, the nucleus of the observation. One of the advantages of, the, of, the, of looking at those patients is they haven't, many of them haven't been on websites and they predate the blog era and so yeah. forth. So their symptoms are purely what they identified. And some of them are children who clearly haven't been on various chat rooms and so forth. And the reason I say that is because one of the criticisms of the observations is that by going to online chat rooms, you get people who've all talked together. Now, yeah. that's a legitimate criticism, but I think it, it, it doesn't go very far because the initial observations were made before the blog era. So we've got initial patients. We have the patients that the eye on vision people um, provided us with to, yeah. to look at their data. And then we developed criteria and went out and interviewed another more than 100 um, 
patients. And out of that group, what's, what's clear is we think that a useful definition is to make sure everyone has visual snow. That seems yeah, like the that sounds like a, a, a given. Although uh, there'll be some imprecision around that because humans never read the book, so yeah. <laughs> there's variation. But let's say that everyone has visual snow, and then we think that they should have some combination of uh, palynopsia, so the yeah, trails so and the uh, and the after images. Um, the so-called entoptic phenomenon, so yeah, the, the blue, yeah. uh, the the, the uh, blue trailers yeah. in the in the sky, um, starbursts, for example, photo photopsia. Um, they should have uh, photo, and they should have photophobia. Mm -hmm. As or photophobia would be one of the other uh, associated symptomatologies. Well, um, we didn't put tinnitus as a visual snow requirement, mm -hmm. although we saw a lot of patients with it, and the reason for that is that. Um, we wanted to try and understand visual snow in its visual physiology context. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? And I, I agree with you that there's quite a number of patients with the problem who also have uh, uh, tinnitus, tinnitus. It may well be that there's a whole other group of people who have uh, trouble by tinnitus, tinnitus and, that they, and they have some overlap with the visual snow. Um, and I, I'm, at the moment I'm sort of parking them over here mm -hmm. until I understand the visual symptomatology, yeah. uh, visual symptomatology better. So we think if people have um, visual snow and some of these other features that we would want to characterise them in our study, uh, in, in studies that we do. Okay. And um, what is the working, uh, the, the theory behind um, that people have this uh, condition? Is it because the brain is overactive or the filtering is broken or the... Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> I mean, the what's happening, uh, stand back from this for a moment, I mean, the, the most important thing we can do is to work out some of the concrete physiology, uh, brain function that's happening because you and I are having this conversation um, I've spoken to many people with visual snow. I get it. That's a, I get it's real. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think everyone gets that. Yeah, uh, so if we're going to trans, if we're going to tr take visual snow from where it is at the moment, which is kind of in the hinterland or outside of mainstream medicine, and get it right into mainstream medicine, mm -hmm. that's going to require um, objective observations of the body function that's yeah. misbehaving, so to speak, and. Uh, I think as we do that, we'll start to gain some insight into whether it's there's areas of the brain that are overactive, for example, or there are areas of the brain that are paradoxically underactive. So if control areas, areas that normally filter information, don't work so well, yeah. that would be a reasonable explanation. If there's an area of the brain that's... Um, oversampling information, perhaps that would be an explanation. I keep an open mind about that. Yep. I think the most important thing is to get the information, to get objective information, um, because the, it's, it's a syndrome, well, as you know, that has suffered a lot of prejudice. Yep. And the way to get rid of prejudice is not just talk about it, but do something that's very concrete yep. to change that. All right, all right. Um, about medication. Uh, people try medication, sometimes it's hit and miss. Um, could you explain why that is? Oh, I think the reason that medicate treatments for visual snow have been problematic are, are a few. The first thing is that, um, if, again, if we're not, if everyone that's called visual snow, if not everyone has it, mm -hmm. then if you higgledy piggledy give people medicines kind of almost randomly, you'd expect a random outcome. So the first problem to stand back from when we're talking about me medical treatments of visual snow is to be sure that everyone that we're talking about has the same thing. Yeah. So that's number one. Number two, we're using medicines, or medicines are being used in visual snow from just about every part of medical psychiatry and neurology, yeah. uh, epilepsy, migraine, and that's because people think maybe patients with visual snow are kind of, uh, got psychiatric problems or... Yeah. I think some people think it might be some form of epilepsy or someone thinks it's migraine. If it turns out it's visual snow, it is what it is, then the problem of non-response is partly to do with 
uh, the, 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 the almost random way that we're currently using the treatments. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think what needs to be done is we need to systematise what we're doing in terms of these yeah. medicines, be sure who's got the problem, what problem we're talking about precisely, yeah. and then start to do some systematic work yeah. with things that are more often reported to be, yeah. um, to be useful and to characterise the patients very, very carefully. So, for example, um, you'll know that some patients have just black and white spots and some people have clear ones and some people yeah. have coloured ones. Is there any implication for that? I don't know yet. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we can know until we start to approach this systematically. So, so I think a lot of the problem with the medicines has, has been around uh, really a lack of systematic approach to therapy. Yeah. And then on the other side, it may be that we need to be developing uh, medicines that are really just aimed at visual snow. Yeah. And again, that's going to require understanding the disease, characterising the physiology and making sure that when we test new things, um, that we test them properly. Mm -hmm. uh, placebo is, yeah. is your greatest friend. Um, yeah. It's the thing which really establishes something works. Uh, it's the thing which establishes it's worth doing. It's your greatest friend. As a, as a patient, it's your greatest friend. So placebo-controlled trials, perhaps with even new chemical entities, new treatment approaches, um, because this is a very unique syndrome. Yeah, yeah. So um, what are the future plans? You spoke about it a little bit, more precise um, yeah, trials or research. Could mm -hmm. you uh, make a synopsis of...? Yeah, so I think the first thing to try and do is to um, get the message out about diagnostic criteria and engage other groups interested in this problem in using the same diagnostic criteria and testing them to see if they make sense. Yeah. And they seem to make sense because I think they make sense to the uh, patient group and that's a very, it's a very good place to start. So firstly, let's make sure we get the, 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 the patient, the, the characterisation of the syndrome correct. And then let's take this well-characterised group and, uh, and try to... So let's take this well-characterised group and try to study it objectively. How? Brain imaging. That will be a very... Uh, it's going to be very important, the various modalities we have now mm -hmm. to do brain imaging to try and understand uh, this syndrome. And electrophysiology, so recording of signals from the brain, um, evoked signals and static signals to try and understand the relationship of the visual change to those uh, signals. I think that... And then when we have that information, to try and alter imaging and uh, electrophysiology signals with, um, in an experimental medicine sense, with medicines, mm -hmm. so we could objectify those outcomes to then go into clinical trials. So I think it's going to be a kind of three-phase thing, the yeah. clinical yeah. side, objective measurements, and then evolving that into clinical trials. There's a lot of work to be done. Yeah. But as you know, just about nothing's been done. So yeah. Yeah. everything we do is New. double... Yeah. what it was last time. Yeah. It's, it's, it's exciting and it's an opportunity. Yeah. And uh, I, I have to say I'm glad to be involved in it. Well, thank you so much. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you for the interview.